Good evening and welcome to Viewpoint. With active cases of COVID-19 being effectively suppressed by Gibraltar's second lockdown, restrictions have been relaxed. But the burden on the critical care unit at St Bernard's Hospital has remained high, given the time lag between the surge of active cases and the resulting pressure on those worst affected by their infection. Respiratory complications usually manifest seven to ten days after the infection. Other types of complications can occur weeks later, and there's often a very long recovery period for critically ill patients. GBC wanted to bring you closer to the life-saving work done in the hospital's specialist department that provides intensive care medicine. We've been given access to these body cam images filmed by the clinical director of intensive care and anaesthesia, Dr Hamish Thompson, as he walked around CCU. We'll bring you more of these images in the next 40 minutes. Care has been taken by the GHA to ensure none of the patients are identifiable in the footage. I also sat down to talk to Dr Thompson about COVID-19. He said it's a strange disease. After a flu-like illness initially, a small percentage of patients develop a severe respiratory failure, COVID pneumonia or COVID pneumonitis. Dr Thompson said, he and his team have tried to focus on the lives they've saved, with morale remaining high despite the CCU being right at the edge of its ability to cope. He said CCU staff are used to dealing with death, but not with the frequency and intensity of recent weeks. The critical care unit's clinical director told me most of his COVID patients have been men. Dr Thompson talked about how important it was to update families and loved ones given they were unable to visit apart from at end of life to say goodbye. Hamish Thompson grew up on The Rock, studied and trained in the UK and worked in Manchester before returning here. He was very generous with the time he gave to Viewpoint. Dr Thompson, thank you so much for your time. Um, can you start off by telling us just uh, how you and your team are feeling after what has been a difficult month, couple of months? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you say, it's been a, it's a, been a very, a very uh, difficult uh, period. Um, so our, uh, our ICU is uh, a 13-bed combined ICU with a coronary care unit and medical uh, high dependency unit. We'd normally at this time of year be looking at three or four intensive care level patients. Um, with the outbreak in Gibraltar, we've seen significant increase in numbers um, with um, at times uh, double figures of patients requiring intensive care level support, uh, large amounts of people needing uh, to go onto ventilators. We've uh, exceeded the ability of our, our normal ICU to cope with the combined COVID and non-COVID demand and so I've had to open a second ICU in what was our day case unit. Fortunately through the, the first uh, outbreak we'd um, put a lot of preparation work in place and had upgraded um, the monitoring and the equipment on our day surgery unit to allow it to function as a much more effective ICU. So we're well prepared from that point of view. Um, and we've been running those two ICUs uh, since uh, the start of the year. Um, we've been fortunate that we've been managed to cope with the COVID patients in the original ICU, in our one ICU, um, uh, very nearly exceeding our capacity there uh, and having to overspill, but managing to just about contain it within that area. Um, we've had uh, double figure patients, uh, over 25 patients coming through the COVID ICU, um, requiring various degrees of support. Um, 
as I said before, COVID is a, is a, is a strange disease in that uh, after the initial flu-like illness, about seven to 10 days later, a small proportion of patients will develop a severe respiratory failure, uh, what we call COVID pneumonia or COVID pneumonitis. Um, we have uh, massively upgraded our ability to cope with respiratory failures uh, over the last year. Uh, we have various devices that allow us to support patients uh, at various levels of uh, severity. Initially, obviously, uh, the first, the first uh, line is to just deliver supplementary oxygen through a normal face mask or through little cannulas underneath the nose. A large number of the patients coming in uh, require more significant support than that. And we have a device now called Optiflow, uh, which is a high flow oxygen delivery system. Um, this has proven to be highly effective and very well tolerated in COVID. And uh, the vast majority of the patients requiring additional support have coped with that level of support. For a minority, we are unable to maintain adequate oxygen levels with that and they will escalate to what we call a trial of CPAP. Um, CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. It's a, uh, either a tight-fitting mask or a, a hood that delivers pressure um, to the lungs to help keep the lungs inflated and to help oxygen get into the bloodstream. Unfortunately, uh, CPAP does fail in a significant number of people. Uh, they're either unable to tolerate it or the oxygen levels uh, are still inadequate. And for those patients, for those who are suitable for ventilation, as in would survive the huge strains on the human body that going onto a ventilator entails, the next step is to go onto mechanical ventilation. Um, we currently have uh, nine patients still on the ICU on ventilators. COVID is not as easy to recover from quickly, as uh, I think even people who have not had to come into hospital will know it leaves a toll on the body. And when you're at the extreme end of that, uh, requiring to go into a ventilator, you are talking a very protracted and slow recovery. And unfortunately for some patients, uh, the strain on the body is too much. And we have unfortunately lost a few of the patients on the ICU uh, over the last couple of months. Thank, thank you for that um, very clear uh, explanation of, of the different uh, levels of support. I think if, if I can ask you about the CPAP, for example, I've, I've read that it's comparable uh, for somebody who hasn't had the misfortune of going through it to yeah. sticking your head out of a window when uh, in a very fast moving yeah. car and trying to breathe then. So I, I think, I think uh, as I said, um, the, the, two, the two devices that we use before we have to escalate to ventilation, um, Optiflow is a much more comfortable device. Uh, it's uh, cannulas that sit under underneath your nose. It is delivering a very high flow of oxygen, um, up to 60 litres a, a minute. So that, that can itself be slightly uncomfortable. It, it's, it, it's humidified. If it, if it were dry, it'd be very uncomfortable. It's a humidified gas. That's much better tolerated, but you're right. CPAP itself, um, it's variable how people respond. Uh, people with a history of claustrophobia, uh, with anxiety issues, tend to struggle a little bit uh, with the, the mask uh, or the hood. Um, some patients have been incredibly tolerant of it, and we've had some people who have uh, managed to avoid intubation purely because they were uh, incredibly uh, tolerant of CPAP and managed to cope with it for a long, long period of time. But that, that's a minority. I, I say a large, a large proportion of people after a long period on CPAP find it intolerable to remain on it. By the very nature of how intrusive it is yeah. and how... Um, how poorly a patient needs yeah. to be for you to consider yeah. intubation. Um, how difficult is it to make that decision uh, uh, and to talk to the patient and their families about yeah. it, given that um, you must know, uh, as you have sort of referenced, that by no, it, by no means is it guaranteed that that yeah. individual is going to come back yeah. out of that deep sleep? Absolutely. Uh, and that, that is one of the challenges that we're facing. So. With all the decisions to go onto a ventilator or not go onto a ventilator, we, we discuss it uh, as a multidisciplinary team amongst the intensive care consultants. We engage the medical consultants in that decision. Uh, often our nursing colleagues are heavily involved in that decision as well. And the patient and their families are clearly central to that discussion. In several cases, um, the patient has plated, uh, stated a clear desire not to go onto a ventilator. Often people are very aware of their own frailty or their own underlying conditions and in most of those cases where that conversation has occurred, the patient has been in agreement with the medical team on that decision that going onto a ventilator would not save them, it would just prolong their life 
but with a lot of discomfort and a, and, and a, a lot of stress on the body added to it. But as I say, it, it is one of the, the more complicated decisions we make and we don't take it lightly. We spend a lot of time uh, in discussion with ourselves, with the patient, with families. So I guess the sad reality is that for some people they would prefer to take the risk of dying but, but to do so more comfortably. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, as, as we have discovered here and as, as our colleagues in the UK and elsewhere have, have explained to us and we have seen in the medical media, uh, COVID is not a disease you recover from quickly. Uh, if you go onto a ventilator, uh, and you have underlying health issues or you are uh, more uh, at the sort of extremes of age, your chance of coming off that ventilator becomes very, very small. Um, so to, to put you through that uh, is a very big ask. So we try to be uh, selective on those patients who wish us to carry on with the treatment and who we think would survive uh, or have a chance of surviving. We've been very fortunate in Gibraltar um, that we, with the resources we've had, uh, with um, the, the team pulling together and with our, our staffing, we haven't had to make decisions about rationing things like ventilators. We have not had to make a decision that we are short on ventilators and we haven't had to, we've had to offer it to the most appropriate candidate. We have made those decisions purely on the medical need and the desires and um, chance of survival of that patient. So for individuals who've been following, uh, as many of us have, the, the international stories, we, yeah. we have heard of, for example, the UK, uh, in the UK, doctors having to prioritise care, something yeah. which they're not used to doing. Yeah, absolutely. And decide who, who yeah. is more worthy of yeah. care first. Yeah. So we've been very fortunate. So we had mechanisms in place to, to deal with a scenario like that. But we have been fortunate that we have never had to decide whether somebody went on to a ventilator or not based on the lack of ventilators, um, which is, uh, I mean, for the team is, is, a, is a, a much more comfortable scenario. We've been making those decisions purely based on the medical uh, status of the patient uh, or the wishes of the patient. And uh, you referred earlier to pressure on the, the physical space that you have yeah. in CCU to... to, to, to uh, help your, your patients uh, in the way that you have to um, and, and provide care for them. Uh, you, you, you talked about there being pressure but and, and almost exceeding capacity but, but not exceeding capacity? Yeah, so, so we, we moved to two ICUs. The main ICU became the COVID ICU. Uh, the entire environment is now what we refer to as a dirty environment. Um, so the, the nursing staff and the medical staff are working in full protective equipment uh, with respirators, um, full overall suits because the environment itself now has aerosol COVID in it because there are so many patients there on ventilators, on CPAP machines. Um, we got to double figures on a, on a 13 bed capacity unit and it looked very likely at one point that we were going to have to overspill into the second clean ICU and move the clean ICU patients into a third zone that we designated in theatres. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been our, our sort of our, our, our true crisis moment we very narrowly avoided having to go into that situation. That said, our services have been under a, main, a, a massive strain. Um, our staff numbers have been pushed to the, to the limits. Uh, we've had to make some uh, tough decisions about bringing patients back into Gibraltar from other ICUs because we, we know that our own capacity was getting to the very, very limits. And if a patient was already in a place of safety, it was decided it was better to keep them there than to put additional burden onto an, a system that was right at the edge of its ability to cope. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, we, we, we pulled together and we managed to not exceed that capacity. So we've heard generally about the pressure on uh, GHA staff by virtue of uh, the amount of COVID cases, but also yeah. um, because of the amount of health professionals themselves uh, who have fallen ill or had to yeah. isolate. Uh, because of COVID. What's the situation been like specifically for the critical care unit? So on the critical care, um, uh, some of the, the critical care doctors uh, had to isolate and, and some of my colleagues uh, also caught COVID. Mm -hmm. um, 
Fortunately, currently, uh, my entire cohort of uh, the, the medical staff are back working. Some of them are working with long-term repercussions of COVID, have, have dragged themselves back to work to help the team, but are still not 100%. Mm -hmm. um, the nursing staff initially were quite hard hit. We had um, some problems with uh, quite high numbers of nursing staff having to isolate or being sick at the time. But as um, uh, immunization strategy has kicked in, um, we find those those problems have reduced significantly. So uh, at no point did it create uh, an insurmountable problem. Uh, and I, I say that the the work ethic of the team uh, has been astounding. Um, uh, the ICU nurses uh, and the nursing staff from other areas that have been drafted in to help in ICU have been working incredibly hard. Uh, their, their team ethos has been phenomenal. And uh, I think because of that, their morale has remained relatively high, despite the fact that they are all tired and have taken a bit of an emotional beating. Um, they've all rallied together fantastically. Um, I've, I've heard it described as um, critical care being tender care in an absolutely brutal environment. Is that a fair that enough? Is, I think that, that's fair enough. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the ethos of our intensive care has been a, a move towards a uh, humanization which has been led by uh, two of our senior nurses um, uh, mainly by uh, our sister uh, Arantxa Velez uh, and um, Pilar Garcia one of our other senior nurses and they have been driving uh, to make the environment as humane as it can be because uh, as an intensive care consultant uh, I have to be aware that my focus is is mainly on the physiology of the patient, uh, correcting numbers, maintaining life. Um, but the ICU environment leaves a, a big emotional toll on the patient as well. Unfortunately, COVID has, has made that very difficult. Um, normally we have a situation where the primary carer or the primary relative of a patient has virtually unrestricted visiting onto the ICU, can spend all their time with the patient. And we have been unable to do that because our environment itself is so risky, uh, A, for people coming in, and also for the patients themselves. Um, patients with COVID um, are often heavily immunosuppressed, are very open to second infections. So we have to be careful from both the point of view of being people in, for exposing them to COVID, but also exposing our patients to additional infections that can be brought in. So we've been unable to, to offer that degree of human comfort to our patients. Um, however, our nursing staff have that ethos at heart um, and there are plenty of times I will walk into a bay and the nurse will just be holding the patient's hand. Uh, there's music playing in the background on the ICU, often that patient's favourite music. As the patients become more awake, we try and get iPhones and iPads in so they can at least FaceTime their families and have some contact. And one thing the ICU team have been very, very strict about is trying to contact the families every single day. Um, so even though we've got very, very long, busy days on the unit, uh, my colleagues and I will stay late at the end of our shift, if it's been a busy day, to just give a five minute phone call to, to the wife, to the son, to the daughter, to explain how their family member's day has gone. Um, and I think it's the least we can do in a situation where they, they don't have that face-to-face -face contact themselves. Uh, and as I said, even though we are completely restricting access to the ICU for patient safety and for visitor safety, in the situation where a patient is unfortunately losing their battle with COVID and approaching an end of life, we do have a mechanism to allow compassionate visiting so the family can be with them for those last few hours. An important goodbye for them, yeah. for sure. Um, if I can ask Dr. Thompson, um, generally we think of health professionals being on the front line, yeah. but intensive care, critical care is the epicenter yeah. of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's been compared to uh, a, a war, if yeah. you like, in, yeah. in, in, in terms of numbers and the intensity of it. Yeah. Is that a fair comparison? I think, I think the first thing I would, I would, I would um, say to that is uh, the front line exists across the health service. Um, I think there has been a disproportionate uh, emphasis from the media on intensive care, on ventilators. It, it, it is the most mechanical and most obvious outcome of COVID. But that patient journey uh, starts at the GP. 
Uh, it starts at the call center of the 111 service uh, who have been offering advice, keeping a, a, a remote eye on people, trying to keep people in their homes where it's appropriate. It extends to the GPs who have been doing home visits, running the dirty clinics, again, treating patients in the community wherever possible, to A&E, uh, to patients who are treated there, sent home, or then admitted to our COVID wards. The medical team have been working incredibly hard. Uh, the nursing staff on the COVID wards have been working very, very long hard shifts, delivering much higher levels of care than would be normal on a normal ward, uh, using things like the OptiFlow device uh, and CPAP in some cases on the ward, which again is, is normally something that would be happening in a high dependency unit. Uh, and then at the very extreme end is the intensive care. And that's only within, the, within this side of the GHA. You need to remember as well the amount of work that has gone in from the ERS team um, and they, they, the uh, elderly residential services team. Um, they were hit with a, uh, a horrendous outbreak um, and uh, faced a, a massive demand on their service and managed to care for a large amount of sick patients within the elderly residential services, um, obviously not wanting to move uh, patients with quite advanced dementia into an unfamiliar environment. Um, so I think I think we have to remember that, that, that there is no front line. It's it's every different part of the service has been working in overdrive, and that that includes our support services. Uh, you know things like our physiotherapy department, our laboratories have delivered a phenomenal service. The amount of testing uh, that has been delivered by the, the the hospital and the university laboratory in Gibraltar is phenomenal. And the ability of our lab to test for other diseases and other processes has massively increased. Our IT department have been working over time, setting up additional monitoring zones, setting up additional computer systems. So it's been it's been a across the board, and I wouldn't say there is a single front line. There's just a more a more visible focus that has happened on critical care, but other areas have been delivering uh, above and beyond. Well, thank you for that very uh, wholesome answer. I, I, I obviously am very interested in in those different yeah. aspects, and we have. Uh, issued reports. I know your comment about the media was a more general one. Yeah, but, yeah, I, I know. But, but I know, we, know. We, we, we have tried to yeah, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, give a voice to, to, yeah. to, to the other departments who, as you yeah. say, are all playing their role. How does it feel um, having an awareness of, of uh, community discussions? Um, how does it feel to you whenever you hear a uh, suggestion that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is maybe a conspiracy? It's no different to a flu. How does that make you feel? I, uh, I, I, I try to ignore that to a degree. Um, we all we all go on uh, Facebook on on some of the the groups on Facebook and see wild ideas populated on there. Um, I try not to focus on it too much because um, we just do our job. The vast majority of people are sensible. The vast majority of people understand exactly what, what Gibraltar has just been through and is still going through, and, and the world has gone through. And a very small vocal minority may put things that are ill-advised or ill-thought out on social media, but they, I say they don't, they don't cause me to, to lose much sleep. But from your perspective, yeah. uh, I mean, I think the numbers speak for themselves, but this is not a normal you haven't had a normal January, and this is not so far a normal February. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, 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 the amount of community transmission in Gibraltar was close to the worst case scenario. Uh, we, we were hit with a massive outbreak. Um, uh, whether that's due to the changing you know, weather, the changing habits that we have during Christmas, the amount of socialising, obviously, uh, or potentially new strains coming to Gibraltar as well. There's a, there's a whole variety of potential reasons why we got hit very hard, but we got very hit extremely hard uh, in, in, in uh, the early part of this year. Um, and uh, I say it's a, it's a credit to all the members of this organisation that we've managed to hold uh, a line against that with, with the amount of community transmission we had, which was horrific. And there's a natural, I think, uh, gravitation towards trying to understand the, the deaths that have occurred. 
so I'm going to ask you a question about that, but then I also want to ask you about the lives that you have saved. How many lives have unfortunately you been unable to save in okay. critical care this winter? So on the actual critical care unit uh, during uh, this outbreak, as in from the very end of last year to the start of this year, unfortunately we, we, we've had five patients we have lost uh, who lost their battle with COVID. Um, in, in some cases we've had people who have elected not to go onto ventilators. Um, Obviously, with with the agreement of the medical team, that that would be a highly unlikely to save their life, but there'd be significant suffering. And other patients we have fought to fought with to the to the very end. Uh, but it's a it's a horrific disease, um, uh, and there are multiple secondary problems that can arise from it. Uh, and we've seen patients suffering uh, from clots on the lungs, uh, from heart attacks. Um, uh, from massive secondary infections, uh, so it's it's not as simple as just treating uh, a failing lung. Uh, kidney failure is a, is another thing that happens quite frequently. It's a, I say it's it. It is a it is a unique disease and and a uniquely harsh disease in a subgroup of people. Is there a demographic for people who are a typical person going through Gibraltar's COVID unit? Yeah, so um, we, we've seen the same patterns that I've seen globally. Um, uh, you are, your age, 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 age is, a, is a, a major factor. Uh, it appears that as you get older, uh, COVID has a higher chance of becoming a severe respiratory problem. Um, so the majority of patients we've seen through the ICU have been in their 60s and 70s. Um, we've had younger patients as well, um, patients in their 40s and 50s. So far we have had m much better results with patients in that younger demographic um, and quite a lot of those younger patients who've been through the ICU are already back home, uh, have come through and gone home. Um, certainly when you're in your 70s it seems that the disease has a much slower progression and takes a lot longer. Um, we have patients on our unit who have been there well over a month now and are still some way from, from being out of the woods. Sure. Um, uh, also, uh, male, being male is a, is a, a predetermined. So the, the vast majority of patients we've had come through have been men. Uh, and underlying medical conditions are a, a major issue. So in some of the younger patients we've seen, especially the sicker younger patients we've seen, they've had very serious underlying medical conditions. Um, and that, that, is a, that is a major problem as well. How difficult is it to, to lose a life on the critical care unit and have to continue giving that tender care to yeah. others around them? I think that's, 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 it, it is an issue that uh, ICU is used to to a degree, but not necessarily with this frequency or this intensity. Um, also, as I say, because so many additional secondary problems can occur with COVID, you find that the team are putting a huge amount of time and effort and emotional investment into trying to save that life and then to lose it. Uh, I, it, it can be very, very distressing to the staff. What we try and do is focus on the positive outcomes, on the patients we can get out um, and move on to the next patient and do the best for the next patient. And I think the, the IC team have managed to do that very effectively. And I, I think after we go through this, I think there's going to be uh, a period where we're going to have to sit back and reflect on all the stuff we've internalized just to get on with the job. But that's something uh, we, we are coping with at the moment and I think we can look back on afterwards. So uh, the team is uh, continuing to function well yeah. and, and you don't need to sort of take time out for counselling or clinical. So there, 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 are, there are mechanisms in place for uh, counselling um, uh, and uh, psychological support. I say our, our, in the ICU environment we've been very fortunate that our team works extraordinarily well together um, and they've maintained a really strong team spirit and they've done most of that within themselves but there are external uh, resources for counselling. Um, we're continually looking out for colleagues that are taking uh, a toll. Um, and you know, it, it's not abnormal to see one member of staff put an arm around another when they see that they're struggling that particular day. Uh, but we, we pick ourselves up and we come back the next day and we try and do the best for the next person. Um, 
and I say every time we get a patient out of ICU, it, 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 it picks up the spirits of everybody because that's one more person who, who has you know, got through this. Well, I mean, you, yeah, you've saved yeah. lives this yeah. winter as well, haven't you? I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that the whole organisation has. Uh, you look at every part of what we've done, uh, and, and the ICU has, has contributed. We've done our bit as well. But uh, every part of the GHA has been fighting to get people through what is a, a horrific uh, disease uh, in some people.